we come to the 17th chapter of the book of Leviticus, and I trust that you are finding this an exciting book as it is unfolding and opening up great basic bedrock truths for the Christian. And though these things were given to the nation Israel in a literal way, they have long since, even the very reason for doing these things is passed away. But all of this contains great spiritual truths for us today and answers many questions. And I rejoice, so many are saying they're being given new insights into spiritual truth that's in the New Testament. Now, this chapter 17 is no exception to that at all. In this chapter, the theme of it is the one place of sacrifice and the prominence of the blood. Now, the impression that some seem to get is that this is a sequence to the great day of atonement that we've been considering. That was in the 16th chapter. And there is a sequence here, it is true, but very frankly, it's not an extension of this at all. There is no reason for thinking that. The subject is different, and it seems to fall, I think, in a rather logical manner, however. Now, it had direct application to the wilderness march and the period that Israel was camped about the tabernacle, because it had specifically to do with that. Now, what we're talking about here will be clean domestic animals for food that were to be slain at the tabernacle. And you can well understand when the children of Israel got in the promised land and they were scattered out, some of them a couple of a hundred miles from the tabernacle, that it would be not only not feasible, but not even possible for them to bring the animals up and slay them that they were to eat. Now, why would God give instructions like this? All right, let's get in the chapter and see specifically what he gave. Now, we have in the first six verses the one place of sacrifice. Then we have the offense of occult goat worship. That's something we want to note. And then the offering of sacrifice at the tabernacle and the obligation not to eat blood. That, a great many feel, is the important truth that is here. And certainly it's the theme of this book that without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Yet they were forbidden to shed blood. That is the other side of the coin. Now let's look. I'm reading verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying. Now these instructions were not for Moses and Aaron alone, and they were also for the sons of Aaron, but also they are for the entire nation of Israel. Why? Well, I think the reason here is obvious, because God now reaches into the personal and private lives of the people. He not only made a difference between clean and unclean animals, which we saw back in chapter 11, but he put down the regulations by which they were to eat the clean animals. The lives of his people are to be different from the heathen round about them. That's important to see. Now, we'll come to that in the next chapter also. I want to read verses 3 and 6. "...what man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people, 
to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priests, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. And the priests shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, I can well hear now some people saying, well, what in the world is he talking about here? This is another one of these very strange laws, and it seems that he's talking about sacrifice again. No, actually, that's not what we're talking about here. These are not ceremonial offering of sacrifices. And when you look at this carefully, it reveals that these animals for food for God's people, and God was demanding that they bring him to the dinner table and by this token shut out heathen gods. Friends, this is very important to see. If God's people today could get squared away on one thing, that you do not approach God except through Jesus Christ, and that on the basis of his shed blood. There is all of this lax and loose thinking about God today. God is only approached as a holy God, and we only come as sinners to him. Now, my friend, when you have that great chasm between, you have to have something to bridge it. And you and I just don't have enough goodness to do it. Even if you were a long fellow, you couldn't reach across it. You and I can't bridge it. The only thing that will bridge it is the one who came from heaven's glory and died on the cross for us and made a way. And he says, I'm the way, and that no man cometh to the Father but by me." Now, why this? Why was God so strict about this? If they were going to have a lamb for dinner tomorrow night, they had to bring it to the door of the tabernacle to slay it. And somebody might say, well, I didn't want all my neighbors to know I was having company and I'd left somebody else out. I forgot to invite my mother-in-law, and I don't want to bring it to the door of the tabernacle. God says, you bring it to the door of the tabernacle. And it's because of their background. You see, among the heathen that were round about them, the meat was offered to an idol before it was eaten. God was putting up a roadblock to hinder his people from taking the long road to idolatry, spiritual darkness, and judgment. You see, they've just come out of Egypt. And these people were idolaters in Egypt. And somebody's going to say, why, you don't mean that, that they were idolaters in Egypt. Why, well, I thought they were down there, though they were in slavery, they were serving the living and true God. Don't you believe it, friend? They were as bad as the Egyptians. I've said before, God didn't redeem them because they were superior or they were serving him. He said, I've heard their cry. And I remember a covenant. I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God says, I don't forget what I promise. And I always make it good. And somebody says, are you sure they were in idolatry? Well, let's let the Word of God answer that. Now, if you would turn over to the 20th chapter of Ezekiel at verse 6 and listen carefully, here's something that is amazing. Ezekiel is reviewing their history. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. Oh, you see, God told them to get rid of their idols before they left Egypt. Listen to him. I am the Lord your God, but they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. My friend, God says they were idolaters in Egypt. 
What do you say? Well, I don't know what you say, but I say they were idolatrous in Egypt. Now, what God is attempting to do is to break them from that long, sordid background that they had down there in the land of Egypt. And he's doing it because they worship every kind of animal and always the shedding of blood and the offering of the meat was used in idolatry. And you'll never understand what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, and again in the 10th chapter. You see that at that particular time, the Corinthians were idolatrous. They brought their meat and offered it, their animal, and offered it to the idol. They just left it there a little while. Then that meat was taken into the temple and sold in the meat market there. And frankly, if you wanted to get the best filet mignon of the day, you got it in a heathen temple. You didn't get it at the local supermarket. In fact, that's where it was. The supermarket was in the temple. Israel had been so schooled by that time that a pious, godly Israelite said, I don't want that. And when they were converted, why, they didn't like to go eat with a converted Gentile that didn't mind taking the meat out of a heathen temple. Well, this, you see, is the background of that. Now, actually, the children of Israel in that day, they had very little meat to eat in the wilderness. I think the incident concerning the quail indicates that. You remember they complained they didn't have meat to eat. Who shall give us flesh to eat was their cry. Now, that was true of all nations of antiquity. And in the present day, the nations in the East are short on meat. Some are actually vegetarian in their diets. Now, a clean animal for food for the table was to be killed at the door of the tabernacle. The blood would be poured out there. The blood was placed upon the altar and the fat offered as a sweet savor. The sacrifice was a peace offering. The remainder of the animal was returned to the owner, and he then could prepare it for his table. You see, that's the reason these Jewish believers in the early church resented that when the Gentiles took meat out of a heathen temple. And the very interesting thing is that the great council of Jerusalem handed down the decision. And James is speaking, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And God was teaching them that because life was sacred. Now, let me move on. In verse 7, we come to something exceedingly strange. And they shall no more offer their sacrifice unto devils, after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. Now, the word devils here actually means hairy or shaggy goats. I wish I had time to spend the rest of the time on this in another period, for that matter. You see, they were guilty of worshiping the nature gods in Egypt. The word here, serim, translated devils, I think it should be hairy or shaggy goats. In fact, that's the meaning. The Egyptians worshiped Mendes, the goat god, and the Greeks and other nations of antiquity worshiped the goat god as Pan. You remember Pan with the pipes and the garlands in his hair as the symbol of nature? And that's familiar in Greek literature and art. He had a tail, horns, and cloven feet. Now, this form was identified later in medieval Christianity as the devil. The word panic, for instance, arose about this time to describe the terror that the devil caused. Therefore, they are warned here, if you please, about this matter of worshiping these nature gods. A man slay an animal out there, clean animal. With that background of idolatry, he's apt to pour the blood out as an offering to the pan god. God says, don't you do it. You bring that animal to the door of the tabernacle. You see what God was attempting to do? 
This is something that I think is very, very important for us to see today. And it was the prevalent danger to idolatry and to gross immorality. And right now, there is a return to nature worship. All of this, friends, this business today of the long hair and going back and living in a primitive way. It's all a return to the same sort of thing. We need to recognize that what God is doing is protecting his people, and he'd want to protect us today from that. Now in verse 8 and 9, "...and thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering a sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off." Now, again, that's a very important thing to see, because God now ties in with it. That man could make a sacrifice out there. God never let them take an offering and eat it. You see, it never was returned back to them. This is for food. Now, if they want to make a burnt offering, then they make it according to the law of the burnt offering, and that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told today, "...wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry." The danger of association with the unbeliever in religion, politics, marriage, business, a social life has a red light placed on it by the Word of God. I get a little weary today. A man was trying to tell me that you shouldn't get on even the platform with a certain evangelist. That makes me a little weary. And you know that this man had stock in a brewery. <laughs> Oh, my gracious friends, how inconsistent can you be when you try to regulate for everybody else? I wish I could go into that, too. This is rich, is it not, spiritually? Now, notice verse 10 here, and I'm reading beginning with verse 10. "...and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it's the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And friends, that's one of the most important verses that's here. I use it as one of the key verses of this book. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And he goes on and on and on, and I'll not read all of the details that are there. Now... This is the great principle that we have here in verse 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Why? The life is in the blood, and that becomes very important. And you remember the Lord Jesus said something very interesting. He says, "...whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. I'll raise him up at the last day." For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, you see, Christ actually was carrying out the great principle set down in Leviticus 17 concerning the blood. This is one of the key verses of the entire Bible, as well as of the entire Mosaic system in the Old Testament. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, what Christ is saying here, you drink my blood. What does he mean? Why, spiritually means that you by faith accept his shed blood for your sins and you will receive life. That is what he's saying. What a great spiritual truth that is here, my beloved, that you have to receive his sacrifice on the cross if you are to be saved. My, can't think of anything more important than that. Oh, today, how this needs to be emphasized. God have mercy on a church that is afraid to talk about the sin of man and the blood of Christ. 
My friends, these are the two keys to the human trouble, the human problem, the human situation. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And let me say this. God have mercy today on the church member or the preacher that denies the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that can save you. And that great big old fisherman Simon Peter said, the precious blood of Christ. It was shed that you and I might have life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Don't miss the great principle that is here and the great spiritual truth that is here, my beloved. Now we've come to another section. In fact, it's a brand new section of Leviticus. We have here immorality condemned. And we have the amplification of the seventh commandment. Now, up to this point in Leviticus, we've only dealt with laws concerning ceremonial cleansing. All rules regulated the ritual of religion and those of the home also. But here, beginning with this chapter, God deals with the moral aspect of the lives of his people. So that now chapters 18, 19, and 20 actually constitute a special section which applies the Ten Commandments to life situations. In other words, we're getting right down to the nitty-gritty, friends. Now, this section opens with a preamble here at the 18th chapter, we'll see it. It closes with one, the last part of the 20th chapter. Now, these are very important as they give the reason for the restrictions and regulations of the social life of his people. Now, we're living in a day when the moral foundations have been broken up and removed. And the question arises, who makes the rules? And what is right and wrong? And that's the question of the sneering skeptic and cynic. But the preamble here offers a twofold explanation. In fact, we'll need the postscript also. But let me read now, beginning with verse 1. And I think I should read verses 1 through 5, because there we have preamble to social prohibitions. Then we'll see... Sexual relations with relatives forbidden. Then sundry sexual sins prohibited. And then offspring forbidden to be offered to Moloch. Then perversion of sex prohibited. And then the nations in Palestine were cast out for committing these sins. Now, this is a very important section. Why? You and I are living in a day that they call it a sexual revolution. I wonder if they've ever read the 18th chapter of the book of Leviticus. May I say to you, nothing new about it at all. <laughs> they're doing nothing new today at all. There's absolutely nothing new today in this field at all. Now, let's look at this, and I'm reading now beginning with verse 1 of the 18th chapter of Leviticus. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. 
neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Now, let's look at this for a moment, because this is very important to see. And the reason God now is going to deal with this, he says, you come out of Egypt, and they broke all the commandments down there. They didn't have them, but they were doing the things that the commandments forbid. And you're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. So many people think when the children of Israel got out of Egypt and went into the promised land that it was all milk and honey. It wasn't. There were some other things there. And there were some Canaanites there. And God saw that they were caught, as we would say today, using the common colloquialism of the day, they were caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Or between a rock and a hard place. The Egyptians back up and the Canaanites ahead of them. And both of them grossly immoral. Why, friends, we call it a sexual revolution. (laughs) May I say to you, this was just doing the same old thing in the land of Egypt, or shall we say, doing what comes naturally. Now, with that in mind, Will you notice that in these first five verses, God says, I am the Lord your God. Then he says, I am the Lord. All right, where is that skeptic that said, who makes the rules? God says he makes the rules. Somebody says, well, I don't want to follow them. Fine. God still makes the rules. And breaking the Ten Commandments is wrong because God says it's wrong. And that ought to be enough to satisfy the heart of the child of God. Now, the skeptic could not be satisfied with any argument because he intends to make his own rules as he's his own God. And by the way, if you can create a universe, I would think you'd have to have a whole planetary system You'd need a sun and a moon and a few stars. And if you can make that, then you make your own Ten Commandments. But as long as you're living in God's world, breathing his air, using his sunshine, drinking his water, walking on his earth, and you're not paying rent, he says you're going to find out these are the things that I command. And if you break them, you'll pay. And my friend, you'll pay. You may not be arrested by the local police, fact, the matter is they won't arrest you. But do you see, you're going to have to stand before him someday. Then he gives a second reason for following God's rules. Now, over in Leviticus 20, at the end of this section, verse 26, listen to him. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. Now, God demands that his people be holy. Purity in all life situations is the command of God. And the child of God is not under the Mosaic system as a way of life. But these regulations are still binding upon his daily life. Now listen to what Paul says in the epistles. The things that God says are immoral in the Ten Commandments, God still says they're immoral. He hasn't changed on that. Listen to this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, and 7. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." That's Paul to the Thessalonians. And by the way, it's to you, your child of God. And then over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 17 and 19. Now listen to Paul. He's speaking to you and me. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk 
in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. I could give more quotations. 1 Corinthians, 2 Peter. These are things that the child of God in any age is called to live a holy life. Know ye not that you're the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, God's calling us to holiness. As a friend of mine, who's quite a wag, as the preacher said to me, he says, why, even the holiness people are not emphasizing holiness today. Well, I don't know whether they are or not, but somebody needs to emphasize holiness. God asks you to be holy. Then there's another great truth here that I don't want you to miss, friends, and it's this, because right now a great many say, if you're going to reach this crowd, you've got to go down and live with them. You've got to go down and be like they are. You've got to go down and just be among them. I don't want to call names, but a famous evangelist went down on the beach to be among them, and he walked on the streets of New York City to be among them. He didn't reach them. And today there are several organizations that have gone down and tried to be like them. And you want to know something? They are like them. (laughs) And the crowd down there is not like holy people either. May I say to you, God's called us to holiness. And England was a pretty wicked place. But you remember that John Wesley's followers were called holy people. (laughs) In fact, they were called Methodists because of the fact their methods were different than that of the world. Now, will you notice as we move in here that God says, I am Jehovah. Somebody says, I'm not a Christian. (laughs) I'm not interested. May I say to you, he's declaring his sovereignty. I said a moment ago, you've been breathing his air. Make your own, friends. Make your own universe. Then you make your own Ten Commandments. Well, he's running this one. And then he says, I am your God. And if you're reconciled to God, you'll want to please him. And the child of God today is to be filled with the Spirit that he might not live this kind of a life. Now, there are sexual relations with relatives forbidden. He says here now, verse 6, will you listen to this? None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. Why? I'm the Lord. You see, the blanket statement is made that no person is to have sexual relations with a near relative. And this entire section amplifies the seventh commandment. Here it refers to anyone who has the same blood relationship as the other person. And he goes on now, he's specific. The nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother, shalt thou not uncover. She's thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now, this warns against disgusting incest. Yet it was in the Corinthian church And Paul condemned it with great feeling. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1, he says, "...it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife." These are things talked about today, aren't they? (laughs) God talks about them too. And he lets you know what he thinks about them. Don't tell me today that God hasn't... He has spelled it out, friends. Nobody can make a mistake about this. And I goes through this, and I'm not going to read all these verses. Beginning of verse 9, "...the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover," and so on and so on. The fact of the matter is, he covers them all. Why? You see, the different human relationship which are established by blood or marriage, they're dealt with specifically in this section. Why? Well, relatives are thrown together in a domestic situation in which adultery could be practiced. And God put up these barriers to prevent it. 
You see, Egypt practiced these sins. After all, Pharaoh and the Ptolemies, they practiced intermarriage of brother with sister. I think that Cleopatra was married to her brother, was she not? Abraham married his half-sister. Cain and Seth both married their own sisters. You see, at the beginning, it was not sinful. But as this awful, poisonous sin got in the bloodstream, why, well, it was actually dangerous. I remember years ago that in the South, there was a tendency for families to intermarry. The governor's family in Tennessee intermarried. And they turned out some strange creatures. The pastor of a church that I came to later on. He married one of the daughters of the governor. And I went holding meetings down in Middle Tennessee. I was asked to go see two of those daughters. They were old maids that had been born in that home of this preacher. They were the most intelligent women, I think, that I've ever talked to. And they were living way up there in the hills. They knew what was going on in this world. They could carry on a good conversation. Well, you say, well, what's wrong about it? Well, friends, I was warned about this. The only thing that was unusual, they had to shoo the chickens off the chair in the living room so I could sit down. Then you had to be pretty careful. And while I was sitting there, the old cow stuck her head around the door from the dining room, and they had the little calves. They just had all their animals in there. And you must admit that's unusual. Well, that family was unusual, friends. May I say to you, God says, don't do it. You don't get by with it, and they don't get by with it, by the way. You will find that all the way through the Scripture, God warns against these things. And today it's positively dangerous, of course, as well as being immoral. He gives certain sundry sexual sins prohibited, 17 through 20. That's the label I have put on this section. And he says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter, and so on. Now, this relationship, you see, is not by blood, but by marriage. And because of the close relationship of the wife to a daughter or son, any marriage is forbidden. Now, I'm of the opinion that this means that a man's not to have two sisters, even, at the same time. In Leviticus 18... In this section here, in the Berkeley version, it says, "...do not expose the nakedness of both a woman and her daughter, neither take her son's daughter or daughter's daughter to expose her, their blood relatives." It's incest. "...while your wife is still living, do not take her sister for a rival to expose her nakedness." You see, this was the problem poor old Jacob faced in having two sisters as wives. But remember, that was before the Ten Commandments were given. It wasn't until Moses' day that these were put down. And they've just come out of Egypt, where all this was practiced. Then we're told in verse 19, "...thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover nakedness as long as she is put apart for uncleanness." That is something I don't care to go in on the radio, but may I say to you, there are doctors that believe that's the way venereal disease came in. My friend, you're not beating God at this. I don't care who you are today. You're not getting by with it. Verse 20, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And believe me, God's throwing up the bulwarks to protect the home from the licentious practices of the heathen round about them. Purity of living was to be the badge of God's family. There was a holy place in the tabernacle for worship. And the home was a holy place in the nation for living. And believe me, there is a great deal in the New Testament on this. Read 1 Corinthians 7 in connection with this. Now, here is something that is quite interesting. They were forbidden to offer their children to Moloch. Verse 21 and thou shalt not let any of thy seed, that is, thy children, pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. This seems to be a little out of place, but it's not. And actually, in that day, in some places, the image of old Moloch was heated red hot, and the bodies of children were placed in the arms. And you can imagine how horrible that was. There are those that believed that that could never have happened 
In 2 Kings, we're told that the Avites made Nabhaz and Tartak and the Sepharvites burn their children in fire. And Jeremiah 7, 31 confirms it. Now, this terrible practice means to profane the name of the Lord. The unnatural brutality of this pagan rite was a deep profaning the name of the true God, because God loves children. (laughs) The Lord Jesus says, let them come to me. And then you have the perversion of sex prohibited. Now, today we find the church right here in downtown Los Angeles. A church put on a dance. For anybody, it would be a little out of line, according to my book. But do you know who they put it on for? Sexual perverts. I'm told they had over 700 there. And it was so disgusting that a hard-boiled newspaper writer went down to write it up and walked out. And yet the church engaged in that. God condemns it. Read the first chapter of Romans, my friend. The depravity that's mentioned here is common today in the great cities of New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And they're all like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's one reason, friends, makes me weep today when I see the way my country's going. I love this country. I was born here, and I'm American. And I hate to see these dirty, filthy, immoral people bringing us into judgment today. And believe me, friends, the judgment of God is already upon us. We can't have peace abroad, and we can't have peace at home. Why? God says, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And he said that three times in Isaiah. Now, let me move on. Verse 23, "...neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself." And if you don't think that's being practiced, then you don't know Los Angeles through the police department. They can tell you. Now, we are told here the nations in Palestine were cast out because they committed these same sins. And a lot of these soft-hearted and soft-headed preachers today, they just weep because God put out the Moabites and He put out the Canaanites too. He put them all out of that land. And why did He put them out? Because He said, "...the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out its inhabitants." Well, what was taking place was the land couldn't even stand them. And today it's well known that that land was eaten up with venereal disease. Why do you suppose God told them not to even take a wedge of gold or touch a garment in the city of Jericho. The reason was because I think a harlot by the name of Rahab could have told you. They were guilty of the vilest sins that were imaginable. And don't you think God put them out for a good reason? After all, if a tenant doesn't pay rent, they can be put out. And God happened to own the land. He'll tell him in this chapter a little later on. He says, the land is mine. I'm letting you have it, but the land is mine. They only have a 99-year lease, that's all. And that's the way you and I occupy this earth down here. Three score and tens promised to us down here. That's the only lease. The land is God's. And if he doesn't like the way you're doing, that's his business, not your business And it'll be well for us to make our business his business, because his business is the one that will prevail. Now, let me turn to the 19th chapter of Leviticus with you. And as we do, we are in this section that we began last time, in which we're dealing with social sins. Actually, What we have is the application of the commandments to life situations. Now, I can't think of anything more practical than this particular section. And God's law was to tell them just one thing, "...ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy." And this was fundamental and basic to all the facets of the life of Israel. It entered into the web and woof of their daily routine. 
and holiness in daily life with all of its relationships was paramount in the everyday living of God's people. And by the way, that today is something that needs to be reemphasized. There are so many people that are fundamental on Sunday, but you ought to see them on Monday. They're not fundamental. They're funny and mental, too. The trouble is that this thing doesn't get geared into living, and God intended it to be brought right into their lives. Now, we know today that the law could not produce the holiness it demanded. And Paul very candidly said in Romans three nineteen and 20, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that were under the law. And by the way, that was Israel, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And today, God, by his Holy Spirit, has provided that dynamic that is needed for Christian living. Now, will you notice these social sins and the first eight verses, man's relationship to God, 9 and 10, man's relationship to the poor, Verses 11 through 18, man's relationship to his neighbor. And then man's relationship in different life situations through the rest of the chapter. Let me read verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Again and again, God is speaking now to the nation, And he's saying to the nation, I want you to be holy because I'm holy. We'll find out that he's going to amplify the Ten Commandments. It sounds like he's being rather redundant here, but he's going to emphasize that particular area in which they were weak. And the future, and for us today, the history of these people revealed God was very accurate. They were instructed to observe the Sabbath, avoid idolatry, and bring the proper offerings to God. Here's where they broke down. Now will you notice that God is asking them in their daily life, they are to be holy. We're told today, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever, you do do all to the glory of God. And if any man's in Christ today, is a new creation, or there is a new creation. That means that we today, just more than little habits, that we are joined to the living Christ. And old things have passed away. We're no longer joined to Adam. We're no longer joined to a legal system, joined to Christ, and we're to seek to please him today. The major difference, of course, is that under the law, they were to do it on their own. Today, the Holy Spirit is given as the dynamic. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And Paul in Galatians says, "...but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness." Faith, meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. The law never went as far as this. And the Spirit of God wants to bring us up to a high plane. Now notice what he says in verse 3. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Now this seems strange at first that God began with the fifth commandment about honoring father and mother. Now, remember, we're getting right down to the nitty-gritty here today. Where do you begin? Well, you begin in the home. And it's not strange when we consider that the parent at the beginning stood in the place of God for the child. The child looked to the parent. The child was helpless. And the child would take anything that the parent would give them. I've had the experience of having a precious little grandson in my home, 
And I want to tell you, I've fed him on several occasions. In fact, I've taken care of him. And I'm here to report to you today that that little fella, he just looked up to me for everything. I could have put poison in his bottle. But do you think I'd do it? Of course I wouldn't do it. But he'd just take anything I'd get him. Little fella just looked to me. And God help the parent that doesn't tell the little fella the right thing. And so God begins there. He says, you shall fear every man his mother and his father. That's where you begin, right in the home. And then he says, and keep my Sabbaths. You see, God reminded them. Now, we'll see something in a moment. He demanded one-seventh of man's time as well as one-tenth of his possessions. And the two commandments mentioned, they first encompass the two major divisions of the Ten Commandments, duty to man and duty to God. The Lord Jesus Christ summed it all up as love to God and love to man, this being the sum total of the law. I'm the Lord your God, so that... Today, though, we find that the Sabbath does not rest upon a moral basis, but it's an arbitrary command of God given to Israel, and Israel in apostasy, and declines sin at this point. They refuse to observe the Sabbath. And they said in Amos 8, 5, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn in the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, falsifying the balances by deceit? This was God's charge and case against the nation. And now he says in verse 4, Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And you see, this covers the first two commandments. The thought here is not to even cast a glance at idolatry. Heathen worship, you see, appealed to the eye in its pomp and ceremony. It still does. You notice the pageantry and meaningless rituals that you see in religion today. It's all eye service. Turn ye not unto idols. Don't look to them. Make yourself idols to look at. And later on, you'll find out God ridicule him. And you know what Paul called him? Nothings. Why, he says an idol is a nothing. <laughs> it's a no-no, friends. That's an idol. It just doesn't exist. Then verses 5 and 8, And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it, and on the morrow, and if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it's abominable. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, every one that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among the people. Now, there's nothing new here, actually about the peace offering. But there are one or two things that we probably should call your attention to that are emphasized here. A peace offering was to be made voluntarily. We already know that. And this did not relieve the offerer from following scrupulously the prescribed rules. You see, he done it voluntarily. I find today that there are those in Christian service that seem to think that they can take special liberty that no one else can take. I find today that they're Christians like that. I know a man called me up when I was pastor, and he said, I want you to come out. I want to talk with you. Well, I said, i very sorry. I have church visitors, and I really am strapped down with my part of the program. And he said, I sent in a $1,000 check to the church. I want to talk with you. Well, my friend, just because you did that doesn't give you any special privileges. A peace offering is to be made voluntarily, but you have to follow it. You're just like anyone else, like the poor fellow that brought a couple of pigeons. He must come to God always on God's terms. And any deviation from the prescribed order penalize the man as an example to the people. You see, it's a positive law, not a moral law. 
There was more danger of failure, you see, because of that. How many people today make a pledge to the church? And we have to say to people, you really, if you're not able to do it, you don't have to go through with it. And they don't go through with it. And yet they would be able to. Why? Well, God says, if you're going to do anything for me, let's do the thing right. I had to go out to a television station and make a tape. They asked me to make a tape to be aired on NBC locally. And I went out. It was at night. That's when they tape all the tape programs. The live programs are on in the daytime. And so they were taping a very popular program that uh, a great many people have criticized, and probably rightly so. The thing, though, that impressed me was the dedication of the people that were putting it on. I went in and watched them. And I want to tell you, friends, I really stay there. Somebody said, well, why in the world did you stay? Well, I said, you know, I've been among Christians so long that it did me good to get among people who are dedicated. Now, I understand why they're dedicated. They're dedicated to greed. They've been paid a handsome sum to do that show. And I tell you, they give it everything they've got. And how many people today in Christian work, they say, well, I volunteer, you know, I just do this. Well, the peace offering was a volunteer offering. God says, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right if you come to me. And my friend today, don't volunteer to do God's work unless you're going to give it everything you've got. Because I'm of the opinion there are going to be a lot of Christians judged someday because of their laziness, because of the fact they did take a job. Somebody's going to say, well, I taught a Sunday school class. I guess he'll reward me. How many times were you late? How many times did you fail to prepare the lesson? That crowd out there that made an immoral program, I'll tell you this, friends, they knew their part. <laughs> They knew their part. And I see Sunday school teachers come flipping through the quarterly trying to find something to say. God have mercy on us. And I think he's going to judge us on that someday. God says, you don't come to me unless you come right. Oh, I love this. Now you notice man's relationship here to the poor. Verse 9, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, Neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and strange them, the Lord your God. You see, that's the way God took care of the poor in that day. We're going to have occasion to come back to this two or three times, and I'll go into detail then. But let me just say this. God never put anyone on charity. He never let anyone sit down and do nothing and receive a welfare check. You had to do something. They could go out and glean. God took care of them. But when that man went out in his field and harvested, and it was done by hand, whatever he didn't get the first time, he's to leave it in the field for the poor. And he's to glean the grapes. Now, I never knew you could leave grapes. I was holding a meeting up in Turlock, California, several years ago. And they found out I just love grapes. And one man told me, said, before you go back, he said, go out to my vineyard. They are picking them out there. You can just help yourself. And I went out. I wasn't able to go that day or the next day. In fact, the last day I was up there. And they had already picked them. The pickers were gone. So I gleaned. I thought, well, if they've left any, I'll get them. Did you know, friends, if I'd had a truck, I could have filled it up. So that night I told the people that I'd been gleaning like the poor people did. And I happened to be among the poor people. My, how I enjoyed that. And that's the way God took care of his people. Marvelous arrangement. And then we have man's relationship to his neighbor. Verses 11 through 18. Notice this. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely. Neither lie to one another, and ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Now, this relates to the eighth and ninth commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Stealing, defrauding, lying, and perjury, all included here. 
and to deal falsely as a form of stealing according to God's definition here, you see. The third commandment is also included here. God's name is holy, and in business, God's man is to demonstrate this by honest and true business dealings. This gets down to the nitty-gritty, doesn't it? Verse 13, "...thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that's hired shall not abide with thee all night till the morning." You pay off the man working for you. May I say to you that I think God would be on the side of labor. I've always felt that. And I'll tell you why. Because my dad, I remember him more in overalls than anything else. He was an engineer for the Munger Gin Company. Built cotton gins in Texas when I was a boy. I remember him in overalls. And he was a labor man. And they beat him sometime. I found that out. May I say to you, you read the first part of the fifth chapter of James. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, God says. Let me say this to you. Yes, godless labor is a terrible thing. But it's not as bad as godless capitalism, friends. That's the danger as I see it right now. Verse 14, Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear thy God. I'm the Lord. Somebody says, You mean somebody would do a thing like that? Sure would, and they still do it. I had a blind man tell me how he was beaten by a salesman that came to him. May I say to you, they'd still do it today. How terrible it is. Verse 15, "...ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor." And this is a word now for the judge sitting on the bench. And the judge sitting on the bench needs a word today. That judge on the bench is to understand that he's to judge as God judges. And I wish that some of them would remember that they are there, not because some politician put them there, they were voted there, but they are there because they represent Almighty God, and they are to judge Him partially. Shakespeare in Henry VIII has this statement, "'Heaven is above all yet. There's such a judge that no king can corrupt. And Socrates said, Four things belong to a judge, to hear courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. And the conception of justice is a woman with a blindfold on. Then we have here in verses 16 and 18, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Wait till we get to Proverbs. We see that's amplified there. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I'm the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge. Notice how this is. This is that which has to do with tail bearing and that's slander. And that goes on in our churches today. Scott wrote, Low-breathed talkers, minion lispers, cutting honest throats by whispers. Someone has put it like this, You cannot believe everything you hear, but you can repeat it. And then other people, they believe everything that's whispered to them. And James has a great deal to say about this. When we get to the book of James, I'm going to tell you about a book I have title of it is Hell on Fire. And you know what it is? That little old tongue that you got in your mouth. It's an awful thing. It's the most dangerous thing in the world today, more dangerous than an atom bomb. And then stand against the blood means to murder. Hatred is not put on a par with murder, but it's forbidden. But our Lord linked it right together and said, if you hate, you're a murderer. Now, If a man's overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You don't go to him and beat his brains out. Now you have man's relationship in different life situation. Ye shall keep my statutes, God says in verse 19. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with diverse kinds. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seeds. 
and a garment with linen and woolen. You know what happens when you wash a garment like that. You see, what God is attempting to teach through this, these are symbols that are telling them that you are not to have the hybrid by mingling truth and error. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons, Paul said. The Lord Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. And then he goes on to talk about whosoever lieth carnally with a woman. Here he is back with the seventh commandment. And this protects, if you read it through, which I'm not going to, the bondwoman. You see, is God lending approval to slavery? Somebody says now. God is recognizing the sinful situation caused by the hard hearts of man, as he did in the case of divorce, you'll recall. The Lord Jesus says it's because of the hardness of your hearts that Moses permitted this. And then in verse 23, "...and when ye shall come into the land, shall have planted all manner of trees for food." Then he talks about the fruit shall be uncircumcised. That means the first year or two you're to pick off the buds of the tree. And they tell you today, these dendrologists, that you get better fruit if you do that. It's interesting, the Lord even knew that. Then verse 26 here, "...ye shall not eat anything with the blood." And we've already been over that because he's emphasized that before. You can't imagine that this would be true, but it was true then, true today. Verse 29, "...do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore." lest the land fall to whoredom, and the land become full of wickedness. And there are men today, that's come out recently, that are going through college by their wife being a harlot. How awful. Verse 30, "...ye shall keep my Sabbaths, reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord." Now, you see, the Sabbath was a peculiar relationship between God and the children of Israel. It was a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. That's what God said. Now, regard not them that have familiar spirits. We've been over that before, and we're going to come to it again. And then you are to respect the old age here in verse 32. And then they are to regard the stranger, verses 33 and 34. And God says, Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes, all my judgments, and do them. Why? I am the Lord. That's reason enough, friends. Can you think of anything to add to that? 